Hello everyone. I'm Archana Pai Kultarni and I welcome you to the August 2021 edition of She the People TV's Women Writers Fest. Today's panel discussion is on hard times, high kai healing, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with three eminent poets, Kala Ramesh, Rochelle Potkar, and Shobhana Kumar. Kala, Rochelle, and Shobhana, welcome to the fest, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me begin with a short introduction. A Pushkar Prize nominee, Kala Ramesh, is the founder and director of Triveni Haikai India, as well as conceptualizer of the Triveni Gurukula Mentorship Program 2021, editor-in-chief of the award-winning Nad Anunad, an anthology of contemporary world haiku 2016, author of haiku, an illustrated children's book. Her book, Beyond the Horizon Beyond, was shortlisted for the Rabindranath Tagore Literary Prize 2019. Published by HarperCollins India, The Forest I Know is her latest book. To bring haiku into everyday spaces, she has initiated several projects, notably Haiku Wall and Haiku Dhyan. Kala has organized eight haikai conferences in India since 2006. Kala has received the W.E. Trailblazer Poet Award 2020 from Women Empowered India. Fictionist, poet, critic, curator, editor, translator, screenwriter, Rochelle Potkar is the author of Four Degrees of Separation Poetry, Paper Asylum Hybrid, and Bombay Hangovers, a latest book of short stories. Paper Asylum was shortlisted for the Rabindranath Tagore Literary Prize 2020. Her next book is translations of Sanket Matre's Marathi poetry to English, cross translations. Shobhana Kumar is a poet and author with two books of poetry titled The Voices Never Stop 2012, Conditions Applied 2014, and seven books of nonfiction. Her work has been widely anthologized as both poems and haibun. Her book of haibun, A Sky Full of Bucket Lists, was published to critical acclaim in January 2021. Her work has been translated into Marathi, Hindi, and German, her poem, Just Married, was personally selected and translated by Gulzar in his seminal compilation of poets in 34 different languages in 365 poems, a poem a day. She's poetry editor of the press venture Yavanika Press and co-curator of the Quarantine Train, a writing collective. Shobhna is founder of the NGO Small Differences, which works with vulnerable communities, the elderly, the abandoned people at the local hospital, and transgenders. Shobhana also works in the spaces of corporate communications, branding and advertising, and higher education. Kala, let me begin with you. Okay. First, let me congratulate you on your new book, The Forest I Know. Thank you. This, I believe, is your first book of Tanka, a 13-year-old Japanese form of poetry. Yes. Now, Kala, a yes, forest is a complex ecosystem. Now, obviously, getting to know one entails great exploration, adventure, and a certain level of intimacy. Tell us what wonders and wisdom your forest holds. Well, the surprising thing is, yes, what you're saying is true. One second. Sorry for this. The surprising okay. thing is that this book is not about the forest as such. Okay. But metaphorically, That's yes, this book is about everything that a forest stands for. Mm -hmm. Let me read Michael Mecklen talks afterward, where he talks about the Thanka from which the title for this book was taken. For me, these five lines express the genesis of this book and the entire arc of its narrative. At twilight, the forest I know by sight. At twilight, the forest I know by sight becomes a forest of sound. Cicada summer. Here begin the poet's discoveries of light and dark in nature 
and in human behavior and relationships. The truths Tala discovers are universal and cross-cultural. There are ordinary moments made extraordinary by what the poet has done with them, inviting our own personal experience of similar moments to fill in the detail and reflect on the importance of the revelations. Aloneness and disconnection, abandonment and deception are made tangible in these tanka. They are dimensions that can be known only over time or in special in, in special circumstances, Kala clearly implies that they may never be known. Eyes and ears open, she will learn what she can and invites us to come along. I think I'll stop here and leave the rest of the viewers present here to find out from the book for themselves. I'd like wonderful. to thank Harper Collins, India, for publishing my book, and thanks Archana for having this, and she, the people, for calling me over. Thank you. Thank you, Kala. Thank you, Kala. Shobhana, let me congratulate you also on your new book, A Sky Full of Bucket Lists. It's a lovely title, beautiful cover. You have written several other books of fiction and non-fiction. This, I believe, is your first book of Haibun. So what veered you towards this form and in what ways was writing this, the journey of writing this book different? Can you tell uh, us yeah. that? Yes. Uh, first, thank you very much for having me as part of the Women's Writers Fest of uh, She the People. Thank you very much, Ashna and team. Uh, absolute delight to be here. So uh, my journey into Haibun began in 2014 um, when it started um, at, at the um, Haiku Festival organized by Ramesh and Tala was a very, very important part of the of, uh, of the festival and I met up with um, uh, two eminent writers, uh, Geeta Anjali and Sonam, and we struck a friendship and we began, my journey in Haibun actually began then. And it was instantly drawn, I was instantly drawn to the form. Um, I'm primarily a pre-verse poet, but this collaborative writing that we've been doing now for the last seven, eight years was a richly rewarding experience for me. And it's perhaps, I think it's perhaps because I write prose a lot. I mean, I do write a lot of nonfiction. I do embark on different genres. I do write short stories. But um, when this book began shaping up, it was actually Anjali Diodar, one of India's foremost hyper writers, who suggested that I start putting a collection together because by, um, by 2014, 15, my work in the NGO space, it, it actually began as a cathartic venture um, with the causes that I was working with. It actually began as a journey where I was trying to make sense of this world of vulnerability, um, uh, this world of marginalization. And um, I think it was very unconscious. It didn't really start out as, you know, towards a book in 2014. That happened only towards the end of 2019, 2020. Um, so, uh, but Haibun allowed me the luxury of um, telling the story um, over fevers. And um, it also allowed me to uh, exhibit enormous restraint, right? To leave a lot of things unsaid. Um, so I think that's what I naturally gravitated towards. Um, and so that's how it came into being. I just hope I've answered your question. You're on mute. You are talking about, yes, you are talking about your organization for small differences, right? Uh, which yes, is, of right. course, I know making a huge difference. So thank you for that. And uh, okay, uh, Rochelle, I know this book, Bom Bombay Hangovers, is a book of short stories and it's a new one. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And uh, Rochelle, uh, we are in hard times and you know that the lockdown has forced people to stay indoors. But I remember in a chat that we had some time ago, you said that you consciously cut out activities that ate into your reading and writing time. And that also included venturing out too often. But it's one thing to choose to remain indoors and quite another to have forced quietude. So in what way was writing easy or difficult in these times, Rochelle? 
first and foremost thank you archana for and she the people for having me over and i'm so glad to be in the midst of shobhna and kala uh, so uh, yes sir, you know you're so right that we uh, as writers seek solitude but what happens when the lockdown infuses that and forces you into a lockdown in a lockdown so that's that's quite difficult for writers because you you waited for the world to quieten down to write not for it to go into a deeper quiet but uh, um, i think uh, this phase allowed me to uh, go into this uninterrupted recursive cycles of contemplation much like uninterrupted sleep you know when you have uninterrupted sleep there is it's very different from interrupted sleep of the same duration so uh, this phase allowed me to really soul search and i think there is a there is a bit of paradigm shift in me as a writer and a poet not only to do with my deep contemplations but also all that the world is going through whether it was before the covid with uh, the citizenship act or whether it is nearly at the end of the covid in a way with the taliban and the fall of kabul something is shifting because we are made to sit in one place and because of that i think it's deepening compassion it's deepening uh, the deepening understanding of life the deeper meanings and i feel somehow haiku is truly sprouting because what is haiku if it wasn't two images juxtaposing to give you a very deep meaning what if what is not being re revealed in haiban which was not just epiphany but we are having so many epiphanies in this quiet time so it is doing wonders for me and uh, of course i am looking forward to the new normal but this quietude has benefited has no choice that's lovely kala when you began writing haiku it was primarily music that fueled your art can you tell us what the other early influences were well that is uh, of course music and uh, it was almost 19 years of uh, being steeped in uh, the 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 nath sampradaya which is goraknath and uh, kabir because i was doing extensively i was extensively into kumar gandharva's gayaki and that helped me a lot because kumar gandharva's gayaki i don't know whether you're aware it's all full of silences and uh, and the voice rising from the nabhi from the stomach there's so much resonance he called it aghat and that helped me in my haiku because haiku is again about silences it's again about how we use ma which is the the uncluttered feel in a room in your poem in your mind and and i think music helped me a lot but if you ask me what are the influences that uh, inspired me before that i would say it's my parents my mother at 91 i'm with her i'm taking care of her now we are taking turns and um, she learned haiku at the age of 90 and she's been writing tamil haiku and she's a poet from the age of 30 you know after doing everything she'll sit down to write and she'll come back and she'll say last night i didn't sleep one word troubled me so much you know things like that when we i didn't even know uh, what she was talking about uh, and then my father he's a doctor he's a uh, what to say allergist and a very good doctor well known doctor but he had such a love for plants every thursday was his off day and every thursday he would take the plant and wipe each leaf you know and in the evening he'll take us to the beach marina beach every thursday we have gone to the marina beach at the age of 6 5 i still remember holding his hands and just walking into the whether it is high tide or low tide we'll be walking into the sea facing the ups and the downs of the high tide and the low tide and i think all this helps us to face life later and he was a motherless child and he used to say life is not a bed of roses always and then the fun we had when we were with him and my parents and the three four of us so i think all that helped me and has always inspired me and yes that's it thank you kala so, may i uh, request you to read your poem backyard well ah uh, yes i will do that one second I have taken few poems which you said you wanted to uh, 
have from the backyard well. As father prays circling the sacred basil, we imitate placing our tiny feet against his wet footsteps, footprints. As father prays circling the sacred basil, we imitate placing our tiny feet against his wet footprints. Tall coconut palms reaching out to the sky. I measure my breath with a cicada song. Om, on our front doors, hers ornamental and mine in plain wood reveal us inside out. Om, on our front doors and hers ornamental and mine in plain wood reveal us inside out. Alone at home, sipping fresh brewed coffee. Alone at home, sipping fresh, fresh brewed coffee, I seek an adult understanding of Sita in the Ramayana. I'll be reading a short Bible. And hammering rain, if only the eye would dissolve. Hammering rain, if only the eye would resolve, would dissolve. A Zen master is asked, how do you practice Zen? The master replies, when you're hungry, eat. When you're tired, sleep. The student asks, isn't that what everyone does? The master replies, not at all. Most people entertain a thousand desires when they eat and scheme a thousand plans when they sleep. Mud covered carcass. Mud covered carcass. All that remains of an eagle's flight. I'll finish off with one more. Very short hybrid. Cool Chennai. An uncut rock under the banyan tree. The memory. An uncut rock under the banyan. The memory. One day in December, a frail man, almost 80 years of age, JK, as he's affectionately called, sits with his eyes closed under the famed banyan tree in his residence. There's pen drop silence as people wait for the master to speak. Birds returning to their nest go in and out of song. 45 minutes later, he looks up smilingly and says, the birds have said everything I wanted to say today. Breathless across the river, the moon where I began. Yes, I thank think. you, Kala. Thank you so much. That was beautiful, very evocative. Shobana, I assume your book was in the making during the lockdown. And do let us know what changed for you in these times and how did the pandemic affect your way of looking at life and your writing? Right. Um, actually, I sent the manuscript out to um, the Bijyoti, um of Red River Press, my publisher, um, just before the lockdown happened. Um, so the, the writing was done from 2014 to 2020. But uh, the lockdown gave me the time to go back and, you know, vociferously edit the work. And um, as we were getting into it, it naturally... Um, some of the poems changed because it was affecting me very, very deeply um, at a personal level. And there was also this, you were locked in, right? You couldn't go out and actually engage with the causes that you work uh, with. Um, so, so my entire team, uh, our entire team was profoundly affected by the lockdown. So um, we, were, we were trying to reach out through phone calls and um, and, and everything, and, and that kind of changes the way you look at the world, right? Because you also realize we have this privilege of uh, 
being locked in, yes, but it is a huge privilege, right? Because we don't have to really worry about what's, where the next meal is coming from. So it made me realize the gravity of uh, the situation outside. And outside the, it, it was unfolding into graver and graver realities. Um, so it definitely did affect um, uh, the writing. But having said that, the book is largely about lost causes. You know, we work with the communities that have never had a future, pandemic or not. Um, so uh, yes, a couple of a couple of poems did change. I did remove some of them that um, seemed pretty self-indulgent to me as I was editing. And as you all know, as we're all writers here, edit. I mean, I think the making of a book lies in its editing more than the writing, right? When you write, you pour your heart out, and then you go with with that pretty ruthlessly at the words when you're editing the work. So I think during it during the lockdown that. Uh, the editing primarily happened. Um, yes. May I request you, Shobhana, to read your poem, Lockdown Learnings? Very happy to. Thank you. Please, yeah. um, Lockdown Learnings. There is more time to look up from the phone. It occurs to me that my domestic health is actually my friend. There are always dirty dishes in the sink, and his obsession to clean has morphed into antiseptic necessities. For the first time in years, I enjoy coffee with the sunrise. No agenda takes on a new meaning. I get an idea of how alone I will be when old. I know what survivor's guilt is. The world will not dare think of another war, at least not just yet. Nothing has changed for the poor, and only we have the time for poems and lockdown. I wonder if I will remember this pausing when the madness resumes. If all the countries can pledge millions, perhaps we will have learned our lessons. Lockdown is a true test of marriage and family. The power of the human touch has never bored the earth well. Perhaps now is the time to invoke the divine within. Warm sake even after a bottle, empty verse. Warm sake, even after a bottle, empty verse. Thank you. The power of the human touch has never bored the earth well. Well, these lines make me ponder. Rochelle, uh, people are now coping with prolonged mourning for their losses and struggling to find meaning in this chaos. And I believe they're turning to poetry to heal. Now, Japanese poetry needs you to celebrate nature, focus on its beauty, and also have enduring faith in it. Now, I wonder whether this does not require courage. You know, there may be guilt to contend with this search for happiness. So what are your thoughts on this? You know, Archana, courage comes from catharsis. And to have catharsis, you need courage. So uh, this collective period of mourning is best uh, accompanied when you express yourself through prose like hai Haibun, which doesn't kind of limit you into act one and two and three and trying to close the prose. So this open nature of Haibun allows this intervention of grief, sorrow, death. And when I teach this in the Himalayan writing retreat courses, uh, even participants who have never ever heard of Haiku or Haibun instinctively and intuitively start expressing something very deep within them because we've all gone through a lot in this pandemic, uh, whether it is from the point of privilege or actually loss. So I think uh, now uh, these prose poetry forms go beyond curating nature and curating us in nature, curating our sorrows and grief and being that intervention which is so cathartic and required, besides, of course, it being lyrical and lucid and everything. Yes, thank you, Rochelle. Uh, may I request you to read Quiet Chaos from your book, Paper Asylum? 
definitely and thank you for choosing that so uh, okay so quiet chaos from paper aside in the common room by the river and long bridge in iowa we celebrate brazilian mexican nigerian and indian national holidays 35 writers from different countries we often hesitate halt rummage for the correct words in english from our repertoire of language uniquely unaccented deep down the same concern inhabits us a renowned writer visits us late one evening walking over the bridge after his major presentation i am visiting my past he says as we look out at our future through the common room's darkening window only night jars and clovers glide over the drift and ripple in the morning girls in hoka uniforms sheer yellow in the sun row boats the bridge is everything in sterling it connects the hostel to shops of pre-loved crockery i pick old china wondering what student might have used it if also only to live a teenage life again the swans swirl over the lock they belong to the queen and have sovereign status i am told and they can crunch human fingers with their beaks twist human arms with their necks late at night i watch netflix to see how scots and brits twist their own english into blasphemy i feel redeemed knowing there are a hundred ways of one language feeling less conscious of indian english time melts into the sharp rays of the sun even at 10 pm writers rehab words descending like angels beautiful thank you so much uh, shobana your childhood was spent in the blue mountains nilgiris your father was a great storyteller he taught you to dream and also showed you how wretched poverty can be how early did you begin with stories that were lost causes what and who are these lost causes that you write about yeah thank you for that achina yes indeed it is magical the childhood was very magical um and my grandfather moved to uti as a, a young adult um sometime in the early 1930s and so we kind of grew up uh listening to stories of um how wonderful it is to grow up with the warm security of a home and how wretched it is to be poor in a cold place right so we always always grown up with these stories my grandfather was a gandhian to part in the satyagraha movement uh, and we were told we even went to uh, a jail uh, fighting for freedom for this country and the stories were replete you know from uh, when my father found a tool be um, note on the road in uti and took it to his father as um, as a eager child 2 rupees in 1940s was big money my grandfather's believed to have uh, immediately taken him to the store uh, bought a blanket and um, given it to a homeless person so this was told to my brother and uh, me several times this is just one incident uh, another was the house help who worked with my grandparents was given a pension until her dying day when my grandfather would personally go to her house uh, up long after she had finished working for them so and um, so you know and my dad was always one my parents both my father and mother my father taught in law school up in always quick to point out that you know life is not as rosy as we see it right it's not an enlightened world and um, very naturally i think i don't think unconsciously we started working towards these but i would always be um, you know um, rooting for the lost team in a sport or for the worst player or for the last child in the class or or, or so, so this just naturally happened and um, we started a uh, small differences um, primarily because of the increasing number of homelessness amongst the elderly abandoned 
moved on to the trans causes of transgender rehabilitation. Um, and I stress that the work we do is extremely small. Um, and this work only pointed to me what it reiterated everything that my father had ever uh, told me about. And uh, that's how my writing began, actually. And that's how it's, that's what, uh, that's what I keep going back to, this, this, this concept of loss, longing, um, uh, pain, abandonment. Uh, this, these are the themes, tropes that I've always gone back to, and I think I will be at it for a long time to come. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Rochelle, you too have been teaching students how to write the Haibun. Do you think the inclusive nature of the form, the freedom to be storytellers, diarists, chroniclers, poets, all at one, all at once can be liberating and redeeming in an uncertain world? And what is happening in your classrooms? So, you know, Archana, uh, 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 we, we as human beings, I think, until the pandemic, we, we came from the standpoint of being immortal. So many times we forget that we are mortal. So I think when, when we are wrapping our narratives around epiphanies is when we realize through all these milestones of existence, how much of mortality we hold within us. And even memory is, is very, very mortal. We may think it's immortal. We may be putting it on a piece of paper, but that pa piece of paper can no longer exist. Maybe before we, we perish or after we perish. So I think, uh, I think this sense of being in the present moment in a classroom and letting your heart loose, because we hold so many things. We cage ourselves up. We shy away from speaking uh, what troubles us. We only want to speak of good things or things that are fashionable, things that are uh, that are wonderful, things that are all about the wah wah and the ah. But there are things that trouble us deep down. And uh, in my classrooms, I urge people to be to have this cathartic need to come out and speak about everything that troubles you. Because if we could identify and make sense of of our lives, we'll probably make a bit of sense of what's happening in the senseless world. And I feel this world is very senseless because it's in flux. It's changing all the time. Although flow is important for life and some of the flow is what we don't want, but we do, we have to be, we, we are forward looking. We are trapped in a forward movement with time and aging. So the only way to make sense is through writing. And one of the beautiful prose senses, prose pieces is Haibun. Of course, I work in different forms from free verse to short story to novels, novellas, screenplays. But I feel what the Haibun allows you to do is immediately wrap whatever you feel in one small powerful page and you feel that ah moment of expression. So that's what happens in my classroom. It's wild after that. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Pala, you teach haiku, tanka, haibun, and renku to children, undergrads, and senior citizens age no bar. Now, do you see your dream of bringing haiku into everyday spaces getting realized, considering its democratic aspect that brings together groups of ordinary people to share their lives, vulnerabilities, scars, especially in these times? Yes, I've been teaching for the last 15, 16 years. And I started when I was just uh, six months into Haiku. And uh, I don't know, I don't even know what I taught them because teaching, being present, the presence that is, uh, that is what uh, Haikai literature or uh, poetry uh, shows us how to do is not easy. And when I teach children, in fact, um, there are so many children who write such beautiful uh, haiku and send you, and then you're amazed how is that the adults have to relearn what we've been doing when the whole world is talking about now, okay? But apart from that, the experiential quality of Haikai literature, be it tanka. Tanka is again such a beautiful concept of five line. It is one of the oldest. It is 1,300 years old, whereas haiku and haibun is only 400 years old. So uh, haiku had taken a lot, like tanka was five, seven, five, seven, seven. 
and haiku is just 575. They've just taken the first three lines and they're doing it. Okay, of course, it's the, the history is large. It's, it's uh, books and books have been written about how to write. But, you know, just before uh, Basho died, he said to his students, he said, Karumi is the most essential quality that we should develop in when writing haiku. And what is Karumi? The lightness, not cluttering it up, the lightness and the clarity. Okay, and that is difficult. And I find that that is gets even more difficult as people are older and they get into, they've done other forms of writing and they, they come into Haikai literature. Now, when it comes to the lockdown, it has got, uh, I don't even know whether you're going to ask me the next question, which I want to talk about the lockdown and the power of uh, the Haiku healing, which I would like to talk, or should I say it now, um, Archana? Yeah, sure. Uh, briefly, yeah. I think we're coming to almost the close of the session. So we, let's yes. do it really. Uh, yes. Quickly. Yes. And this topic, Haiku for Healing, started as a vague idea after I spoke about something similar at the British Haiku Society Spring Gathering in June this year. And I felt I should do something for Triveni Haikai India, which is what I have just um, the website and the group of people. And uh, they are a huge group of very enthusiastic uh, Haikai lovers. And uh, you won't believe, immediately I had around 30 participants, Shobhana is one of them, and around 52 cheerleaders. And we were 80 of us in that Zoom meeting. And everyone came and told me later that it was such a Heart, heartfelt moment that they had when they listened to all the other difficulties that people have gone through and they were not the only one facing problems. And that is what it is. When we seclude ourselves, we think we are the only ones facing what we are facing. And the rest of the world, it's like the Facebook uh, uh, you know, the news. We think the whole world is happy and except I'm the only one moaning. That is not there when 80 of us shared a common feeling and that became the haiku for healing. And I always, you know, I always uh, in Max Werhardt's, uh, when in, in my workshops, I take Max Werhardt's haiku, which has been with me throughout. You know, it is falling apple, the branch sweeps into a new balance. I still remember when I asked a 13, it was eight standard kids I was teaching, and I asked them, what does it tell you? One child, a girl, she got up and she said, I just lost my, my dog one year back, and I couldn't get out of that grief and that pain, even in spite of all everyone telling me to come out. And she said, someone, my teacher, I think it was, she said, start writing poetry, and she said, I started writing poetry about my dog. Every poem was about my dog who passed away and who's no more. But I remembered all the happy moments with her and all the sicknesses and all the periods when we had to carry her to the hospital and bring her back. And she said, that healed me. She said, now I can smile back and say, yes, I owned a dog and she was great. And she had a good life and so pleasant and so happy, fortunate we were to have her with us. And I think that bouncing back I think is haiku for healing and haiku does that. It's not, when I say haiku, it's not just haiku. It can be senryo too. It can be haibun. It can be renku. When, when 10 people get together and they write about the lockdown and all their feelings, it all comes through because it's experiential poem. It is not made up. The makoto, the truth, the poetic truth is there. And I think that's what yes. is yes. magic. Yeah. Shobana. Do you also think that words can heal, words can hug, and what works have held you together? <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, it, it is Haikai writing that has held me together, uh, undoubtedly, I speak um, mm -hmm. uh, on that. And um, I have uh, drawn a lot from Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. It's a book that profoundly moved me. One of the earliest books that moved me the city of joy that my dad gave me when I was in class eight, right? Uh, and said, this is a book you must read to understand what I'm talking about. Um, Mary Oliver is my all time favorite poet because I think she teaches you just how to be one with nature. 
and the masters, right? The masters um, of uh, words can hug, uh, can heal. I mean, just look at the profoundness of the word hug at the time of the pandemic, right? It's the most, um, we've been deprived of this, right? We can't hug our friends. We've not been able to hug our family. It's a three letter word. And what can't a hug heal? It can heal everything from teenage crushes to a profound loss. So I think I just stop with that. I think we've run out Thank of time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Rochelle, uh, loss can give birth to gratitude for what remains. At this moment in time, what do you feel grateful for? I feel grateful for so many things, for not being affected by the COVID, for each new dawn, each new day being a new hope, a new, you can turn a new leaf, a new page. I feel all of us who have survived uh, have to take on this world, give it more meaning, give it hope, be there. And like Shobhna said, hug people, hug people once the new normal arrives, because we are the torchbearers of hope, all of us. Thank you so much, Rochelle. I think we are running out of time. We've actually run out of time. And uh, I have to thank Kala, Rochelle, Shobhana for being here. And thank you, viewers, for joining us. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this session. I hope you did too. Of course. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much.